welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast. In particular, I'm highlighting once again the old time radio snack wagon. And our focus on that program is just bringing you a great variety of shorter, bot-sized bits of radio. Whether it's self-contained programs or excerpts from longer programs, we've had a great mix of original dramas as well as some comedic excerpts featuring Charlie McCarthy, Groucho Marx, and Jimmy Durante. You can check out uh, the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon and all the episodes we have posted over at snackwagon.net or wherever you get your podcast. Now it is time to begin this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. We will be playing episodes one and two today. If you want to listen to all the episodes together, You can wait until Friday, just pause it right now, and then come back and resume, and then immediately listen to episodes three through five. But now, here are episodes one and two of The Purling Matter from June 18th and June 19th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Martin Scottman, Mr. Dollar, at Eastern Liability and Trust. Oh, yes, sir. Got your message. I was just about to call you back, Mr. Scottman. Would it be possible for you to drop in and see me today? I think so. Say in an hour. That would be excellent. What's it about, Mr. Scottman? David Perling. Perling? I understand he was killed in a boating accident a couple of days ago. Read something about it in the papers. To borrow a phrase, Mr. Dollar, that report was somewhat exaggerated. Mr. Perling is still very much alive. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the purling matter. Mr. Scantman, you're a pretty good guy, and I'll say this right at the top, since you were the one who called me in. You're reading about the purling matter in your newspaper right now, but they haven't got the story right. None of them will ever have it quite right. Just remember that as you go through your newspaper in this report, Mr. Scantman. You looked pretty worried when I met you that afternoon about 5 o'clock, and you led me into the top drawer offices of Eastern Liability and Trust. I tagged you as a meticulous sort of man who knew when his laundry was coming back. I wasn't a bit surprised to learn that you were vice president and chairman of the board. Why don't you sit down there, Mr. Dollar? It's the best chair in the place. Thanks. Cigar? Cigarette? No, I have these. Thanks. Lighter right there to your right. Thanks. Yes, Mrs. Scarman? You can run along for tonight, Evelyn. No more to do. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, Evelyn. I, uh... I understand you've handled several matters for our company, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I was just going over it in my mind. Uh, I believe the last one was the San Antonio case. Yes. Mark San Antonio. Yes, yes. You handled that very well, Mr. Dollar. I want you to know I appreciate your reputation in the field. Nice of you to mention it. I'm curious, Mr. Scottman. I rarely work directly with an insurance company. Usually I'm hired by the adjusting agency. And let's say this is a little idea on my own. Only one person knows about it so far. You will be the second. Board of Directors might not exactly prove what I'm about to propose, but I feel some action should be taken. I have uh, some good whiskey in that cabinet. If no, you... thanks. No, no. Yes. Well, this case involves David Perling, who, despite what the newspapers reported yesterday, is still very much alive. You say you saw the item in the papers? Yes, something about uh, him being killed in a boating accident in Florida, I think. The story was erroneous. It'll be retracted. Oh? 
Fact of the matter is, Mr. Perling was already on his way back to New York, safe and sound when that report came out. The boat that he'd been fishing from did have a boiler explosion, but no one was killed. Well, these things sometimes happen, I guess. Oh, sure they do. However, it was printed all over the country. As you know, David Perling is highly regarded in financial circles. And that is the reason I asked you to come in and talk to me. Did you uh, see the stock exchange figures yesterday? Well, uh, I don't pay too much attention to them, Mr. Scott. I do. Uh, we do, as an insurance company. That report of Perling's death affected several commodities listed on the New York Exchange. Companies in which he holds varying positions. Positions that would, uh, if, say, the report of his death were engineered for that specific purpose, allow certain people to risk very little money and make a great deal of money. Uh, just a minute, sir. Certain people? Are you talking about Perling? I don't know who I'm talking about, really. I'd like you to find that out. Find out, among other things, if the situation has been taken advantage of in any way. Mm, this isn't exactly in my line, Mr. Scudman. I think it is, Mr. Dollar. I'll come right out with it. Eastern liability has considerable investment in some of the commodities that could be affected. We, or let's put it this way, I want to know where we stand. I want to know if we've been cheated or are about to be cheated. <laughs> I had dinner with Morton Scottman at his club. He acquainted me with the several companies involved in the matter and supplied me with stock exchange information that would be valuable in making comparisons in case the action he anticipated ever happened. An hour later, I was at the airport. Expense account item one, $123.69. Airfare and incidentals from Hartford to Key West, Florida. I arrived at 4 o'clock in the morning, found a hotel and had six hours sleep. At 11.30, I was standing in the office of a bluff, red-faced man named Peyton. He happened to be the managing editor of a newspaper. Uh, all, the, uh, all the way from Hartford, Connecticut, eh? Well, welcome to Key West. What can I do for you? Tell me about this story. Ah, a Perlin story, huh? Yeah. You a lawyer? No. You here to make trouble? Just find out something about how that story got into print, that's all. We're retracting today. What do you want us to do? Wear sackcloth and ashes? <laughs> well, I'm not here to file a suit. I just want some information about the story. You can sit down if you want to. All right, thanks. Find Gracie Edwards, will you? Right. Well, it's about like the newspaper story, except for the mistake. That was a pretty good-sized mistake, Mr. Payton. Berlin was here for a week to ten days. He had an idea he could catch some tarpon or sailfish. He chartered a boat called the Yacht Watcher. Day before yesterday. Just heading in for the landing. Somehow the fuel ignited and she blew up. Everybody thought Perlin was still aboard her. Who was aboard her? Mr. Skibber. He came out of it all right. Harbor patrol boat picked him up. Mm hmm Go on. Everybody thought Perlin had been aboard as usual and was lost. The skipper wasn't in any shape to tell it differently then. After all, Perlin had been going out on her every day. We all knew that. Where was Perlin? He was sleeping in his room when all of this happened. Got up about three o'clock, checked out, took the train back to New York. Story came out in the evening edition. Your reporter, the one who wrote it up, I'd like to see him. It's a her. Well, how did she get the story? It was right there. Right where? What do you mean? Down at the sailfish landing when the yacht watcher come in. That a regular beat? In a town this size, we don't have beats. But... Your reporter was there when the boat caught fire. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Gracie Edwards. How long has she been a reporter? A couple of years. Give or take a month. Hope you didn't come down here to run her over the cold. Oh, she's had enough of it, Dollar. For me, it's my job, not yours. Okay, okay. Where do you eat lunch around here? Bluefin Bar and Grill, about a half block down this side of the street. Dip beef and apple pie, if you like that kind of thing. Oh, hi, Gracie. Yeah, this is Johnny Dollar. Gracie Edwards. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Mr. Dollar's come all the way from Hartford to ask you some question about the Perlin story, Gracie. You want to talk to him? Do I have to? Up to you, honey. Who are you? What do you want to know? I'm an insurance investigator. I want to know how the story got into print without being verified. Well, that's a straight enough answer. Um, who do you investigate your insurance for? Eastern Liability and Trust Company at the moment. Yeah, he's got business cards and everything. Yeah, he looks like he might do that kind of work. Well, if you're going to talk to him, find someplace else. I've got work to do. How about some lunch, Miss Edwards? How about that? Oh, get out. Expense account item two, two dollars, two lunches for Gracie Edwards and myself at the Bluefin Bar and Grill. 
She was a short, stocky woman in her early 30s. She had a fresh-looking face and fiery red hair. She didn't strike me as the kind of reporter who'd make a bad mistake. I did it the way any cub would have, only worse. I had a three o'clock deadline. I wanted to make it. I could have waited till the skipper came to, said Perling wasn't aboard. I could have contacted Perling's hotel, found out he was safely there. I didn't do any of that. I just phoned in my story. You know the rest. Every wire service in the country picked it up. Guess I was lucky I wasn't fired. Mm-hmm. You want another glass of beer? Mm, no. No, thanks. You've been pretty nice. I'm sure you're not all insurance investigator. Notice I haven't asked you exactly what you're investigating. Yeah, I noticed that. You gonna tell me? Possibly. Right now, something worries me. Uh, you were down at the landing when the boat caught fire. Yeah. You go down there often? It's more or less my beat. Oh? What? I didn't think a reporter would have a beat in a town this size. I said more or less. I like to go down there in mid-afternoon when the boats are coming back. The water's blue and fresh. Usually a good offshore breeze blowing. Now, if they caught any big fish, the flags are up. It's a place to go. I'm romantic. Good. Suppose we go there. Hmm? 2.30 now. Ought to see some of those boats come in. Expense account item three, one buck, one cab. Transporting myself and Gracie Edwards' reporter to Sailfish Landing, or as near as we could get. The last 500 yards, we had to walk on the planking between the slips. Now, uh, tell me, where was the outwatcher when she blew up? Uh, over there. About there. Uh-huh. Where were you? Right here. I was sitting right there. Looking out to sea? Uh-huh. How long had you been here? Oh, an hour or so. That was day before yesterday? Yeah. She blew up there. You phoned in your story before 3 o'clock? Yeah, right before 3. Where's the outwatcher now? They raised her this morning, towed her over the repair docks. That's around the point. That's kind of funny. What's funny? Well, I, I guess I didn't hear it right. You, you saw her get in trouble. You were right here. Then you went and phoned in your story. That's right. Where'd you phone it in? What? Last phone I saw was at the tavern before we came on the docks. High heels running over these slips. Take quite a while to get to it. I used a phone in town. How'd you get there? Cab. You had one waiting? Look, suppose I did. Suppose you didn't, Miss Edwards. Suppose you weren't even here. If you were, where's the sunburn? Every redhead on earth burns up in an hour when the sun's like this, unless you're an exception. I don't think I like this. I don't like it much myself. But I have to find out something. I'd like to find out from you. I hope I can. If I can't, I'll have to find out from someone else. Maybe the man who owned the boat, the man who ran it, someone around here. I'm going. Wait a minute. I'm not just throwing words around. The boat was probably insured, and it'll probably have a claim on it, and I'll probably know the adjuster who was sent to work the claim. I'll talk to him and tell him what I'm thinking. I'll find out about this one way or another, Miss Edwards, but I think you can help me. Now, you're a good reporter. You would have waited to see if Perling was aboard. You would have checked his hotel. You would have, in spite of a three o'clock deadline, you would have made sure he was or wasn't aboard that boat. All right, Miss Edwards. Did somebody pay you to file that story? I just want to know that. Somebody paid me, yes. <sighs> okay. I'll take you back now. We don't have to mention this again. Yeah, okay. In case it comes up, though... Yeah? Mr. Perling paid me. Paid me to print the story he was dead. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford. Uh, hello? Hello, Mr. Scottman, Johnny Dollar. Hope I didn't get you up. Uh, no, no, no. I've been very anxious to hear from you. Well, I thought I'd better call, Mr. Scottman. I just found out that David Perling paid a reporter here in Key West to print that story about his death. Yeah, I see. I can be in New York at 7 tomorrow morning. Could you meet me there sometime? I can meet you at Idlewild. My plane comes in at 7.20. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. Mm -hmm. 
Expense account continued. Item three, ninety-eight dollars and nine cents. Airfare and incidentals, including board and room, Key West to New York City. Mort Scottman was in the airport coffee shop having tea and toast in the best tradition of a vice president. He looked shaved, rested, and fresh. Would you uh, like some breakfast, Mr. Dollar? Mm, just coffee for now, thanks. Cup of coffee, please. Well, we seem to have made nice connections. Not uh, 7.30 yet. Yeah. Mr. Scottman, the reporter in Key West who printed that story about David Perling was paid $100 in cash to do it. Perling paid her to file an erroneous story that he had been killed in a boating accident. You said uh, cash? Yeah, that's right, cash. No check. No way to prove it one way or another. Just the reporter's word. And she said she'd deny it if anybody else asked her. Disclaim the whole thing. Well, where does that put us? Well, look, Perling had to pay somebody to fire that boat. Probably the skipper, I don't know. But it's an angle if you're thinking about legal lines. It's very good. Of course, the boat would demand explanation. Well, let's let it go for the moment. I noticed a retraction disclaiming the story of Perling's death is in every paper this morning. It was in all of last night's papers, too. Now, if the story could affect the stock market, when would it show up? Today, at the latest. There was no action yesterday? Not on the exchange, no. How do you feel about this whole thing now? In view of the fact you've ascertained that Perling himself arranged for his own death report to be published, I can only assume that he did it for one reason. To take advantage of some brisk trading that would occur because of such a report. But there's been nothing of that so far. Hmm. Uh, tell me, Mr. Scotman, in the event this does happen, what would you do? Well, I, I don't know exactly. Possibly report the matter to the exchange and see if Perling could be prosecuted for manipulation. Well, let's go over there and see what's what. <laughs> Item four, five dollars. Cab fare for myself and Morton Scottman to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange. Since I didn't understand too much about the board, I simply sat and kept an eye on Scottman. The pinstripe suit, the Hamburg, the tie, the shirt, the glasses. <laughs> Somehow he tickled me. I was beginning to like the guy. About 15 minutes before the place closed, he cleared his throat and touched my arm. Uh, I uh, suspicioned wrong, Mr. Dollar. There's been no manipulation on the exchange. I thought certainly if there had been any, it would appear in that Alabama company. <laughs> I was wrong, and I apologize for taking up your time. You're paying for it. Besides, I'm glad you did. Mm -hmm. Shall we go? Yeah. Where? Well, we know he didn't have the story printed to cheat on the market, but we still have the same old question. What's that? Why did Perling pay that reporter to say he was dead? The reporter lied to you. You've uh, been lied to before, I'm sure. Oh, sure. And by experts. But she wasn't a good one. Not even halfway good. So I still believe her story. You believe that board up there? I believe that, too. Well, then? Perling had a reason for getting such a story printed. I want to find out about it. <laughs> Expense account item five, four dollars, lunch for Morton Scottman and myself. After lunch, I checked into the new Weston. Item six, fifty dollars deposit, car rental. A phone call to the offices of David Perling gave me the information that Mr. Perling was at his home on Long Island. I drove out there. A small estate greened up with all the lush things that happened there this time of the year. As I reached the place, I noticed a group of people in white flannels and dark blue jackets mixing cocktails on the terrace. One of them I recognized from previous newspaper pictures as David Perling. A middle-aged woman with iron-gray hair and the figure of a 16-year-old girl opened the door. She looked from behind dark glasses disapprovingly. Yes? How do you do? I'd like to see Mr. Perling, if I may. I'm Mrs. Perling. May I help you? Well, this is a business matter, Mrs. Perling. My name's Dollar, Eastern Liability and Trust Company. Well, he's not in now. I suggest you call his office and explain the nature of your business to his secretary. Good day, Mr. Dollar. Look, I know he's here. I saw him as I drove up. You are both impertinent and rude. I'm sure he'll see me if you give him my name and tell him I just came back from Key West and that I had a long talk with a newspaper reporter down there. Since you saw so much as you drove up, you might have noticed that we're entertaining guests, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I noticed that. Wait here. I stood there a moment on the wide colonial porch and wondered what made me such a social outcast. A man who was tending the grounds walked by and turned on the sprinkling system. He waved at me, and I waved back. I felt better. On the terrace, I could hear the tinkle of glasses and a little laughter now and then. Finally, David Perling showed up. He was a tall man with a hairline that started about an inch above the heaviest eyebrows I've ever seen. Two-toned shoes, white flannels, and a Mexican sports shirt fitted in with a broad shoulders and wide-mouth grin that came off just briefly when he looked at me. My wife told me to throw you out. Can you think of any reason why I shouldn't? I'm about ten pounds lighter than you, but... I might be a good 15 years younger. Tell me what you want, kiddo, and then get out of here. 
I want you to tell me why you paid Gracie Edwards $100 to print a story about you being dead. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. What's all this to you? An investigation. There's no way you can prove I paid that girl to print that story. I know that. I was telling a friend of mine today that something probably could be proved about the boat, if it had to be. Then the reporter thing had come out. I don't know. You see, Eastern Liability had an idea that you might have had that story printed to cause a little action on the stock market. Who at Eastern Liability? I'll keep that to myself. Well, doesn't make any difference anyhow. They're way off base. Or can't you figure that part? That's why I'm here. I figured that part. Suppose I told you I don't know what you're talking about. I'd ask you all over again. Tell you about a reporter and a boat. Dollar, you've gone this far, and it's probably as far as you're going. I'm not going to tell you anything. At least anything specific. I will tell you this much. I paid the reporter in cash. I paid the boatman the same way. Whatever reason I had, it was a good one. Meant to harm no one. You're sure about that, Mr. Perling? As sure as I'm going inside right now and mix another batch of martinis. For the second time in a matter of minutes, I was standing on a porch feeling like Typhoid Mary. Somehow I halfway believed David Perling. I also halfway believed that whatever reason he had meant something to me. All halfway thinking. If you want to be left alone, you don't slam a door once or even twice. You invite the asker of the question in, give him a drink, introduce him to your friend, slap him on the back, and lie through your teeth. You don't tell a man to leave, because that's the best way in the world to make him keep coming. So I waved at the friendly gardener once more, climbed into my rented car, drove back to the New Weston, and sat down with a magazine. Johnny Dollar. This is Celia Perling, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Perling. I think I should like to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. David told me why you were at the house. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm downstairs in the lobby. I'll be right down, Mrs. Furling. I had to drive some friends in tonight, and I thought I'd stop and have this chat with you. I'm glad you did. Somewhat embarrassing. I mean, after the way I acted at the house. Oh, well, suppose we forget that part, Mrs. Perling. Does Mr. Perling know that you're here? No, I'll tell him when I get home. There's something I must know. What's that? You aren't just a sensation seeker or something like that, are you? Mrs. Perling, let me answer you this way. You came to me. How you found me, I don't know, but you did. You also found out I'm a legitimate investigator interested in facts, am I right? David called a friend of his with the Allied Bureau, and they told him you were an insurance investigator. Uh Uh-huh, and they also told you that when I work a case in New York, I generally stay at the New Weston. Is that about it? I'd like to ask you a question. Are you going to continue with this matter, the one you discussed with my husband this afternoon? I suppose I am. You mean you you believe there was something ulterior and David having that story printed? Well, let's say I believe his answers about it were unsatisfactory. I'm the fellow who's supposed to find out why. Why? It's my job. I can assure you there wasn't anything wrong about it at all. It was a rather personal matter and certainly could harm no one. I'm glad to hear that. I heard it once before, though. Your husband said it to me today in practically the same words. Would you like to buy me a drink? Sure. Come on. We walked through the lobby to the cocktail lounge without a word. We sat down without a word, and I ordered a couple of bourbons and water. Still no word. All around us, people poured drinks, laughed, and talked. I glanced at Mrs. Perling from time to time and wore the blankest expression I knew how. Finally, it worked. She began in a small voice. We have a daughter, Mr. Dollar. Her name's Eugenia. Jeannie, we call her. Mm Mm-hmm. She's the reason for that story in the papers. Tell me about it. It's not easy, you know. It's... I mean, it's, it's admitting a prominent defeat to explain it. We're... David and myself are considered quite capable people. Capable at most everything. Business, home. Yeah, capable of everything except raising a child into a woman. I'd rather not go into the faults that we have, Mr. Dollar. No need to. Are they that obvious? I didn't mean that. I just mean it seems painful for you to even discuss this. I'll say it this way. We've had too much money and too little time to put it on... on Jeannie. Now we're suffering for it. How do you mean? Jeannie got sick and tired of being alone and unattended and not understood. She left home a year ago and we haven't seen her or heard from her since. She left a note saying that we never would. I suppose we deserve it. Well, I wouldn't try to judge that. We have no idea where she is, what she's doing, even if she's with someone. We just know she's gone. It's really quite ridiculous. 
Now that Jeannie's gone, we know how much we wanted her around. What about the police? Well, we... We didn't go to the police. I think you can understand why. I mean the publicity. Who did you go to? The Aimwell Agency. They've been working on it. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Any luck? Not a sign of her. Do you understand now? Well, I don't understand everything. I'm sorry she's missing. But about the story in the paper... Well, Davy arranged that. I mean that his death would be reported. It was a crazy thing to do, I suppose. But we've tried everything else. He thought that if he were reported dead... Jeannie, wherever she was, was, would see the story and possibly contact me. You see, it's, it's unbearable knowing she's alive somewhere, hating us this way. We wanted another chance. No luck? No luck. Not a word. Not a word. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the trap is all baited. And guess who walks in? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, I really love the scene with the reporter when Johnny was just able to use deduction and common sense to tear apart her story and get her to tell him what really happened. Now, there's an interesting continuity point. Uh, as John Abbott notes in his book, The Who is Johnny Dollar Matter, uh, Mr. Scotsman held... Johnny that he had worked for them on the San Antonio Manor. And, of course, the San Antonio Manor was actually a John Lund story. And uh, on that case, he worked for Great Eastern Fidelity and Life Insurance Company, not the Eastern Liability and Trust, as noted in this case. And, of course, Bob Bailey did essentially the same story, although there were some elements of other episodes included, with the Valentine matter. But on that particular case, the company was the New Britain Life Insurance Company. Now, given that, I would say that that is evidence in support of the different Johnny Dollars being in alternate universes. Where the San Antonio matter for Bob Bailey is a story that was just not aired and had very different uh, circumstances in his universe and a company with a slightly different name. That makes more sense than Johnny having two cases with similar extreme outcomes. 
Now, back to the current episode, uh, you know, you might wonder why this investigation is uh, continuing, like the insurance angle might be debatable given that uh, the company uh, did not detect any manipulation and that's why uh, Johnny was called in. But I think Johnny's right in this case. Just because there's no obvious uh, manipulation doesn't mean that you can rule out something that might harm the insurance company's investment interest until you uh, figure out exactly what's going on. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and uh, we have some comments regarding... The Indestructible Mock Matter over on Facebook, Greg writes, I enjoy Johnny Dollar, but I've got to say I really enjoy this story. Keep up the great work. And then uh, we have a comment from Will on Instagram writing, First, Mr. Graham, thank you for delivering uh, these tales gratis. Second, I'm sorry that I listened to a few of these, but while you critique this episode, I... Love this yarn. This charming bum wouldn't die in the production values. As a tangent, I miss listening to Nightbeat. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate the comment. And I will be clear that I definitely enjoyed the indestructible mock matter more this time through. And overall, I thought it was uh, pretty good. Uh, my opinion of it has improved over the years. I, I will definitely second your thought about not be it was such a wonderful series it was great a couple years ago when we had a previously uncirculated episode of not beat down and we're able to share that with you and i really would love more there are just some great stories some pretty unique ideas that ended up being told on that series that you don't tend to hear on a lot of other programs although there were cases where not beat scripts were used elsewhere after some heavy rewriting but it was such a great uh, role for Frank Lovejoy there were actually Australian and uh, South African versions of not beat I've not listened to them I'm somewhat skeptical that they could match that same level of quality so I definitely agree about Not Beat, and I would love for us to be able to play more. And then David has a comment regarding the matter of reasonable doubt. Have to say that this set of episodes had some of the more interesting female characters, especially Susie and Nikki, not to mention the grandmother and Hilda, the classic femme fatale. That's a good point, David, because most of these serials have one or at most two really good female parts. You might have more, you know, functional roles or something like that, but generally just one or two. So to have four of those parts running an age gamut is something that you we don't hear a whole lot of on this series. So not something I noticed, but I think you're absolutely right. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Jonathan. Jonathan has been one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2020, currently supporting the podcast at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Jonathan. And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of this week's Johnny Dollar Serial. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... He has worked at the Fronton for the past two years. In Francisco Rolas, no police record. That's all we have on the dead man, huh, Lieutenant? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, you say he was involved with the smuggling ring, Senor Mitchell? So we were led to believe he was going to fill us in on it. Only somebody with a knife got to him first. Someone obviously from the organization. They must have known he was going to talk. Yeah. Where was Rhoda staying? According to his identification card, uh, 36 Paseo de Baracoa. Let's go over and shake it down. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. 
From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.